Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I'm Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, we're going to circle back to California. Why? Well, because they haven't won a single appellate case all year. That's why. Yeah, they have had a terrible year so far. 0 for 6. But hey, don't worry, California. You always got the Ninth Circuit there to catch you when you fall. Now, you guys may recall that California had this crazy law where you could only exercise your Second Amendment right to actually purchase a firearm once every 30 days. You know, a quota on what is supposed to be an inalienable right. You also may recall that a California that a United States District Court in California threw that law out for its obvious constitutional violations. Well, California is now appealing it and they are freaking out. They need that injunction stayed right away because all hell is about to break loose if this law is not allowed to stay in effect. So today, let's go through the memorandum because it's going to probably tick you off a little bit. And let's talk about California goes crying to the Ninth Circuit again. Okay, before we get going too far down the road, we're going down. Proud to announce that this video is being brought to you by Right to Bear. That's right, legal protection for self-protection. Listen, good lawyers aren't cheap, cheap lawyers aren't good. You're not truly prepared unless you have Right to Bear back you. You will always get an attorney answered hotline, so you will always have a confidential phone call. There are no cap limits for either civil or criminal defense. This covers all forms of self-defense. So from a fist to a firearm, from a fat lip to a dead body, you are covered and you will have some of the nation's most passionate 2A attorneys in your corner fighting for you. And right now, if you visit my friends at protectwithbear.com and you use the promo code WGL, you will receive 10% off. Listen, you need to protect yourself so so that you can protect them. Visit my good friends at protectwithbear.com. Okay, hey, we're talking about California, so a quick shout out to our first ever California subscriber. Of course, that is Philip P. Philip P. has, in fact, been watching this channel since I had a hairdo that looked like this. He's been spreading the gospel of Washington gun law in the state of California ever since. So, Philip P., this video is for you. The case we are talking about, and we have talked about this case before, is the Win v. Bonta. This was the successful challenge to the California law that said you could only purchase one firearm every 30 days. Now, the law has been in existence for a number of years. It was only certain platforms that would apply to the 30-day provision, but eventually all firearms were grouped into that, which means there is a quota on when you can exercise your otherwise constitutional right in the state of California. Now, I mentioned to you that this brief that we're going to go over today from the state of California is pretty infuriating. And anytime I'm about to go over an infuriating brief, I always do warn you that maybe you should hit pause for a second, do some breathing exercises, maybe pour yourself two or three fingers of bourbon, get it down there a little bit, and then we'll hit play and we'll get going, okay? Now... When I say that this brief is offensive, I am not kidding here, okay? It's not hyperbole because the legal argument that the state of California makes is offensive. The innuendos that they give about lawful and responsible gun owners in the state of California are equally offensive and their use of scare tactics, coffin surfing, whatever you want to call it, absolutely discredits any credibility that this brief even had a chance of having. Why does California even need this law? Well, this is how they put it. While California law does not limit the total number of firearms that any person may possess, the one gun a month law addresses the particular dangers associated with bulk purchases that occur within a relatively brief period of time, such as straw purchases and illegal firearms trafficking. The law makes it more difficult for criminals to acquire firearms by reducing the flow of guns into the black market and thus curtailing the illegal gun market. Yes, it stops criminals from getting firearms by making sure that lawful, responsible citizens cannot get firearms. But the state of California goes on to say, the law also makes it more difficult for individuals to stockpile firearms for criminal activity. Absent a further stay from this court, the district court's injunction will irrevocably alter the status quo by allowing bulk firearm purchases, which have been prohibited as to certain types of firearm for years and actually now bars all times. And listen, what the state of California is saying is, is that you've got to do this because, well, it's always been the law. Because an injunction barring the enforcement of a duly enacted statute poses a substantial risk of harming the public interest, appellate courts routinely issue stays pending appeal when lower courts enjoin a statute. 
Now, what could possibly be their argument here, right? What historical tradition could there possibly be that would justify limiting a person to purchasing only one gun a month? Well, the way that California comes at it is they don't need to provide a historical tradition because, well, the Second Amendment doesn't even cover this activity. Let me say that again. The state of California is under the belief that the Second Amendment does not even cover this activity. In particular, the Second Amendment's text concerning keeping and bearing arms does not cover the unconditional right to purchase firearms, let alone a right to purchase any number of firearms in a single 30-day period. And I say all the time, especially to the appellate courts and the Supreme Court, careful about the language you use, because if you leave one little word in there, one little word, they will build a mountain out of a molehill. What is the authority that California cites to for this proposition? Heller. Really? The one gun a month law falls within the category of presumptively lawful regulatory measures recognized in Heller because it regulates when a commercial firearm transaction can take place. Nothing, in our opinion, should be taken to cast doubt on laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. Bruin did not change that category. Now, California, I just want you to know that your attorney general and your state government believes that if you could actually go out and purchase a firearm more than once every 30 days, each and every one of you is clearly going to be doing it for nefarious and unlawful purposes. You're all going to be helping create unlawful caches of weapons. Don't believe me? This is what they wrote in their memorandum. The equitable considerations also overwhelmingly supports a stay pending appeal. Without a stay, bulk firearm purchases would suddenly become legal in the state and bulk purchases of handguns would be permitted for the first time in more than 20 years. Such purchases would inevitably make it easier for would-be criminals to stockpile private arsenals and increase the number of straw purchases and illegal firearm transactions, jeopardizing public safety. Even if the challenge provisions were later upheld, it would be virtually impossible for the state to identify and unwind any unlawful straw purchases that occurred during the interim. Just like it's impossible to undo them right now. Now again, to show you just how disingenuous this brief is, on the same page, the state of California argues that the Second Amendment does not cover this activity at all. But if it does, well then there's ample history to support this. In the same paragraph, the following is found. The proposed course of conduct here, purchasing more than one firearm from a licensed firearm dealer within a 30-day period, does not prevent individuals from keeping or bearing arms and thus does not fall within the scope of the Second Amendment. And even if this court were to assume that the one-gun-month law implicates rights protected by the plain text of the Second Amendment, the law is consistent with our nation's historical tradition of firearm regulations. Now, I know you guys are all scratching your head going, what are the possible historical analogs that the state of California could come up with? Well, they can't come up with any. So, of course, they've got to pull out this little trick that we're seeing more and more frequently, which is that perhaps this court should take a more nuanced approach. And what people who are advancing this nuanced approach really means is, is hey, we kind of just want you to disregard Bruin altogether. As California puts it, However, when a challenge law addresses either unprecedented societal concerns or dramatic technological changes, a more nuanced approach is needed. And with that, then what the state of California is arguing is, is that we don't need to go way back in the history books. Just about anything will suffice under this new nuanced approach. The district court imposed the requirement that regulation must also be long-standing in addition to following within one of the categories set forth in Heller before it may be considered to be presumptively lawful. And in this court's view, a 20th century regulation is long-standing only if it is supported by relevant historical analogs from the founding or reconstruction eras. This is an incorrect reading of Heller. Heller considered firearm possession bans on felons and the mentally ill to be long-standing even though they were not acted until the 1960s and it reached that conclusion without identifying historical precursors to those laws. And so with that nuanced approach, what California wants to argue is, is, hey, close is good enough. And what I mean by close is I don't mean in the ballpark. I don't even mean in the parking lot next to the ballpark. What I mean is probably somewhere inside city limits of which there is a ballpark with a parking lot next to it, as California tries to argue. 
The tradition is reflected in the historical laws presented to the district court below, including laws enacted in the 18th and 19th centuries regulating the purchase and storage of gunpowder, restricting the sale of pistols and other weapons, and taxing the sales of firearms and requiring licenses to sell firearms. But ultimately, the reason that California needs this Ninth Circuit to step in right now and stay the injunction is because they're still pissed off about the last Freedom Week, okay? Because when you guys had like four whole days to live free like an American a few years ago, yeah, the Attorney General's office in the state of California is still really, really bent out of shape about it. Don't believe me? Well, they reference it right here in the memorandum. In Duncan, the district court did not issue a stay pending appeal until four days after its injunction went into effect, thus permitting anyone who acquired a large capacity magazine during the interim to keep them during the appeal. During that interim period, over one million large capacity magazines reportedly flooded into the state. Here, a similar threat of mass bulk purchases of firearms strongly favors imposing a stay of the judgment pending appeal. Even if this court were to reverse the district court on appeal, it would be impractical, if not impossible, for the state to restore the status quo ante by removing from circulation excess firearms sold during the appeal. The case, once again, is Nguyen v. Bonta. It sits before the Ninth Circuit with an absolutely ridiculous argument by the state of California. Translation, yeah, the Ninth Circuit's likely to grant it. So therefore, our prediction is, is that the injunction on this law will be stayed. We will get more shenanigans out of the Ninth Circuit, and this will ultimately be settled in a higher court. Listen, if you got any other questions about this, or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights. You guys should know how to get a hold of Washington gun law by now. If you don't, that's okay. That information is down there in the description box. And then finally, let's everyone remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.